the so the stream here says that we are live so i'm just gonna make this public so even people that are not my friends can see it mm -hmm. okay And to let anybody who's watching, please share out to your friends and family know. Okay. Okay. So we've started getting audience. And this grows the time. Okay. So should we start? I mean, are you done sharing on your profile? If not, then just let me know when you are. No, we can just start. Okay. Hello, are you there? Yeah, good morning. Okay, yeah. So hello everybody, thank you so much for coming in, tuning in. Today we have um, a new person with us. I'd really love if you can uh, pronounce the name for me because it's a very unique name, I've never heard of it. Um, and so today we're gonna be having an interview with him. Amazing, so excited. And let's have him introduce himself. So hello, how are you doing? Good. I'm good. How are you doing? My name is Kwaku. Okay, Kwaku. Yeah, that's that's yeah. actually a new name that I learned today. So, thanks. And let's have you uh, introduce yourself as to what you do and where you're from. Sure. Um, my name is Kwaku Anning. I am originally from New York. Um, I currently live in San Diego. And uh, my role, oh, with applause, there you go. My role, I'm the director for the Center of Education and Entrepreneurial Thinking. Amazing. So uh, I think uh, we should start from the, the start, start, like the, the, the supreme start. Where were you born? Uh, I was born in, uh, in the Bronx, in New York. I see. And uh, do you have any siblings? I have a, I have one older sister. Hmm. Uh, so, how was your childhood? I mean, in general, how were you as a child, and how was like your early childhood? Um, it was great. It was fun, you know. Um, uh, growing up in New York, I mean, I'm obviously I'm not 13, so I'm a little bit older than you are, but. Uh, growing up in New York uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s was really uh, inspiring and I think is uh, is definitely a huge part of who I am today from the things that I would see in our neighborhood, you know, riding the subways, that sort of thing, um, to the curiosity that I bring to my current job. I see. And so when you started growing up, what was your interest, like your area of interest in like your Teenagers, early teenagers. I was, um, you know, yeah, especially at your age, I was really into music. I was, um, I, you know, I, uh, as I got older, I played music for a few years, but um, mm -hmm. th that was it. My dad was uh, really into jazz um, because of where he went to school. He went to school in Kansas City. He lived with a bunch of jazz musicians. And so um, I kind of got that from him. And then, Later on, we moved, and I really got into rock music, and so I played in a ton of rock bands growing up. I see. Uh, now, I, I I really you know relate to that because I feel like right now I'm 13, and I and I really love music. So that that kind of phase is going on in my life right now. Um, and when did you decide that like this is what I want to do? um as far as uh my current job or as far as being into music which one being into music and also uh, 
uh, picking your career path because you know it's always that you're in high school and you're picking oh my god what what do i have to do and it can be hard for some and very easy to pick for others so how was it for you that the experience good question um so here's something they don't really tell you when you're younger you don't really actually pick your career path your career path picks you mm -hmm. um and so i didn't you know i don't know if i ever chose to be a musician as much as it was something that was a part of me that i discovered as i got older and so it just be it was just sort of like uncovering this part of who you are and then um within my current job although i don't get to play music as much everything that i've learned as a musician as far as how songs work or how to interact with people you know when you're younger and you're playing and you're in bands and you're learning how to interact with people um how to take something um take something that starts as an idea and turn it into something that's a little more tangible and bigger that involves people um those are all things that i learned um playing music with really just amazing amazing people um who were really talented who you know some some of them still play today um and so those are all things that i incorporate into my current job which involves a lot of um creativity and sort of bringing things together that would not normally go together whether it be in education or types of thinking or processes that um that i get to sort of work on with with students I, I see, and you know, one thing that you said was something so beautiful and it's like kind of stuck in my head and things get stuck in my head and get out of like a week or two, but you know, part of it is still there, is that you're, you know, when you get older, you discover that part of yourself. I mean, I got older, well, for me, it was really young, but I was 11 when I was like, oh my God, stand up comedy is the thing. And then even now I'm discovering a lot more about myself and then parts which is not so big as much to take up as a career or, you know, go after so much. Um, and tell us more about your current job and how that started, that kind of a journey started for you. Uh, well, my current job, it's, it's great. It's sort of, I mean, it's this really long title, but essentially I'm an innovation director. Um, um, for a program that's part of a larger school. And um, it, I, I think the journey sort of started um, essentially, you know, I was playing music and then I became a music teacher. And so I taught K through five music for 10 years. Um, and then at one point, uh, being a music teacher, you have all this time during the day because you don't see, you don't see the same kids uh, at the same time. Uh, the way a traditional classroom teacher would. And so one teacher asks me, she's like, hey, you know, I'm trying to do this thing online, but I can't get online. And this is, you know, this is going back 20 years at this point. So Wi-Fi was kind of a new thing. She, so she was like, hey, can you help me out with this? And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, I have, I have an hour and a half to spare. Um, so then I did that. And then more teachers started coming to me and asking me uh, if I could help them out with some of the technical things they were doing in their classroom. And then I realized, oh, well, this might be an interesting job. Um, and uh, I guess I'll sort of keep it on a the music theme a little bit. Part like a lot of the musicians that I really, really love um, continue to evolve. They didn't just sort of uh, develop one uh, sort of, I guess, artistic statement or approach and do that for 40 years. They had these different phases. You look at David Bowie, uh, you look at someone like Madonna, you look at someone like Prince, these people were constantly evolving as artists. And so I kind of looked at it in a similar way um, where I was really comfortable as a music teacher and I, and I thought, okay, well, I could do this for the next 30 years, but I kind of want to do something a little bit different or a little bit more. Um, and try to evolve myself. Um, so that involved going to grad school um, and finding a program that um, that would, I guess, help me get to this, whatever this thing was. I didn't know what it was at this point. And so I figured, all right, I'm going to go to grad school and I'm going to learn how to be an IT person and, and I'll learn how to build computers and how to edit movies. I, I had no idea. And so I, you know, I went, I got into this program at NYU and um, 
we spent the first year just talking about cognitive science, which is essentially how the brain works and how the brain takes in information. And I was like, man, all of this is really interesting. But I'm also kind of freaked out because the school's really expensive and I've gotten married, uh, you know, during this point. And, and, I, and I was like, well, what am I what am I going to do to make money? <laughs> I'm going to come yeah. out of college or come out of grad school. I'm going to owe all this money. And I don't see any jobs for cognitive scientists. Um, and so, you know, you know, fast forward a little bit. I got in a job while I was in grad school where I was helping teachers to use technology in the classroom. So essentially what I was looking to do in the first place. Um, and I got to do it uh, for New York City schools as part of this larger program that gave free computers to middle school kids and gave them free internet access. And my job was to work with the teachers so the kids would have something to do at home. And so that was you know, I did that for about uh, four years and I was like, man, this is great. This is everything. And then you continue on that evolution piece. And I was like, all right, but I kind of want to do something more. This is cool. But I, you know, I'd gotten to this point where I was like, all right, well, I understand this and, and I get this and, and Fatima, I'm sorry, Raheen, as you get older, you, and you get a job, you realize that things you love about your job and there are things you're like, this could definitely be better. This kind of annoys me. Um, and so what I ended up doing was, um, pivoting again. I went to go work for a larger network of schools. It was about 30 schools where I was in charge of, um, digital learning for those schools. And so that involved helping schools buy computers and, and working with, um, the academic people at the school to develop programs that would utilize them. And I did that for a little while and I realized this isn't really for me. I don't really love this. Um, and so then I worked as a consultant for a little while. And then finally I went, I, I moved with my family out of New York and we moved to Memphis, Tennessee. Now I know obviously you're not from the state, so these places probably are places you've heard of, but I don't know if they resonate with yeah. you in any sort of way, but Memphis is very different from New York. It's a lot smaller. Yeah. It's in the Southern part of the state. So the culture is, is very different from what I was used to. Um, and so my family and I were down there for three years and, and the job there changed. It went from, all right, instead of working with, um, low income schools where you're really trying to get as much, uh, into schools as possible, get as much bang for your buck. Like how do we, uh, help the largest group of kids, um, in the, in, in the way, in the simplest way, in the way that you have the largest effect, but it's not too complicated because if it's too complicated, it's probably too expensive, um, to going to the opposite scenario where you have a small group of kids and there's a ton of funding. Yeah. Um, and so, um, instead of having this urgency of, all right, well, we have these kids and we need to make sure that they have the best opportunity to go to college. Um, and so how do we make sure that they understand fundamental things, uh, within, you know, uh, reading, uh, math, um, science, that sort of thing. It was, it was a completely different job where they're just like, all right, well, why don't you tell us what you want to do? What are the ideas that you're interested in? And what do you think kids should know about that maybe they're not thinking about currently? Um, and so that, that was the beginning of, of becoming an innovation person, if you will, which is kind of mm -hmm. what I do now. And so if uh, you look at my current job, you know, I, I do a few things. I, I get to work with teachers still and students, which is fantastic. Um, I, um, uh, I get to manage um, our IT department. And the best part of my job is I get to chase ideas that don't seem like they're connected to schools and find ways to make those connections. I see. And I feel like after after listening to this this amazing, um, I, I wouldn't even say a story. It's like an amazing thing that you just said. The only word I can come up with is beautiful. I mean, this is this is beautiful. And I've got a lot of questions. Okay, a lot of okay. questions. Uh, okay. The first one being now you said you were a music teacher and you were comfortable with it, but yet it wasn't something that you would continue. You, you would want to continue doing for about the next thirty years. Right. Tell me, right. how was exactly being a music teacher and what is it that you thought? Because here music taught, music is taught like differently. It's like a, it's more of a like just a free period that we 
kind of don't study in. So mm -hmm. it's nothing big, you know? Right. Now tell me how it was and what were you teaching? Because, you know, music, well, there is science applied to it because again, it's frequencies again to, through our ears and to our brain and how it yep. processes, yeah. long story, cut short. There yeah. is, but yeah. it's too complicated to teach in one lesson, right? Mm -hmm. And then it being something that comes truly from the heart like not even the mind, like truly from the heart crosses through the mind and comes yeah. out. So yeah. how is it, what were you teaching? So it's, an, it's interesting that you say that because everything you're saying is right. None of that is wrong. Um, it is spiritual. It's something that comes from the heart. It comes from the heart. It's also an art form, um, but then it's also a language and it's also a science. And so I taught kids uh, kindergarten through fifth grade. So um five years old to about your age maybe a little bit younger mm -hmm. than you and i would teach a lot of the language of music and the science of music so i would teach a lot of music theory um you know some uh i would say some cultural or music appreciation pieces and tying music to classes like art and english um the and you know for instance there's a thing i would do every year uh i think it was second graders where this second or first anyway but where i would sort of connect the concept of writing music to writing stories you know your notes or your words your measures or your sentences and then the movement that happens from the beginning of what you're playing or what you're writing to the end um, is the story that you tell so that was mm -hmm. the language portion of it the science portion of it was essentially, uh, you know, I, I took a lot of pride. There are, there are a bunch of different um, techniques you can use to teach people music. Suzuki method, which is really more about playing and less about understanding the, the way that mm -hmm. the notes all work together. Um, but I would, with kindergarten, I would actually start teaching kids about notes at that point. Because if you're learning any language, which music is, it's better to learn it when you're young. And so the idea of the names of the notes, how they work yeah. together, how they worked with rhythms um, and then progress them to the point where they're playing instruments and then eventually, you know, coming up with their own compositions, whatever those things sound like. And, you know, there's some kids that I would, you know, do separate, you know, things like guitar lessons for that sort of thing, who just um, were really able to connect all three of those things together. The idea of the science, the math of it, the language piece, um, and then also the expression and the storytelling, which was, which was great. Yeah. Um, and then you shifted to being a, a computer person and then you yeah. studied um, cognitive, what was it? Cognitive, cognitive sciences, science. right? Yeah. I forget. I don't know why. Uh, tell me more about that experience. I mean, I know it must have been great because that is um, something that I want to research on and something that I really like. Of how, how, the, how does the brain respond to information? Right. Uh, which is basically right. the basis of a lot of what today's happening, interviews and um, marketing, a lot of things, they just kind of base on this uh, science that is cognitive science. How was the experience for you? Well, it's, it's funny and it's interesting how you frame that because sometimes at work people are like, well, you're the computer guy. And I'm like, well, kind of. <laughs> the computer's the tool um, and I understand how we use that tool and how it works with our thinking, but I wouldn't call myself a computer guy. You know, I, I mm -hmm. know how to code a little bit, um, but I'm not a coder and I do a lot of stuff now with, uh, AR and VR and some AI stuff. Um, mm -hmm. but those are, I mean, at the end of the day, those are just tools similar to teaching music to either tell a story or relay information. Um, the one, like the biggest takeaway I sort of got from grad school, um, was that the technology is always going to shift. It's always going to change right now. We're on StreamYard in two years, there's going to be a better version of this that people are using. Um, and so in this, in this place where in this world, where all these variables keep changing the hardware, the technology, the software keeps changing, keeps, it keeps leveling up and getting better. The, the constant factor is actually our brains and how our brains interact with that. And so that's the, that's the thing, the North star, the thing we sort of hang our hats on and we go as far out with the technology as possible, but the reference point is always our brain. And after my first year of grad school, I realized, um, 
that um, I realized that if you understand that, then it's very easy to be to connect how to learn using the tools of technology. If you understand the best way um, to basically take things, and this is like a cognitive science term from your short term memory into your long term memory. If someone gives you a phone number right now, you can remember it. And maybe you'll remember it for like uh, five minutes before writing it down, you know, however many numbers it is, seven, you know, whatever numbers. Uh, but if someone gives you three sets of numbers and let's say breaks them down into, you know, three, you know, three and three, that's easier to remember than remembering nine numbers altogether. So t things like that. Um, basically, how do we take information, make it important to our brains and, and put it in a place where we can recall it and apply it to other things? That is essentially what I do, um, but in interesting ways. And that's pretty much how I was able to make that connection between cognitive science and technology. I see. And, and then you had this big move and I, 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 you know, as you even said, when you said this, I don't live in the state, so I don't get it right. but right. one thing i surely get new york is the place right <laughs> i've been <laughs> about new york a lot i mean i yeah. really like that place um and well there's no place like that uh in fact yeah. a few of my relatives actually live in new york so got some mm. insight there but the place that you moved to if you'd say that again memphis what is what is would you like to explain that move a bit more because i guess new york was the place that you kind of grew up in and had yeah. so many memories yeah. until now so how yeah. was it and plus new york being kind of like the central place there's a lot of events happening and uh famous people living there and yeah. it's kind of like yeah. the hub for a lot of things but when where you moved how was that like well and I don't want to shortchange Memphis because Memphis is a, is actually a pretty amazing place itself. Mm -hmm. um, it's just in ways what you're describing, it's very different from New York. Um, there are famous people who live there, it's just less of them. Um, and it's just mm -hmm. smaller. In New York, you have, what is it, uh, 20 million people. I mean, it's, it's probably different now with what's happening with the pandemic and stuff. Um, but when I lived in New York, if I would see the same person on the subway, um in in a week that was amazing i was like i need to talk to this person what are the chances of seeing the same person on the subway twice in one week it's crazy and in memphis was just so much smaller so you would go to work and maybe you'd have a friend at work and then you'd go back home and you'd have a neighbor and then your neighbor knew this friend from work even though you know, uh, they're in completely different contexts. Mm -hmm. And that would happen all the time. When there were all of, basically there are a lot, it was very easy to connect with people because there are less people there, um, which is which is good and bad because it makes it easier to become part of a community or feel that you're connected to a place when you have all of these things that connect for you. Um, your friends, no other friends or whatever the case might be. Um, and so Raheen, uh, where you're from, Raheen is probably a super common name. I'm assuming. No, it's not. It's, oh, it's the it's realest not. name. <laughs> okay. All right. So then you can relate because where, yeah. um, you know, growing up Kwaku, my parents are from Ghana. And so in Ghana, Kwaku is a very common name. It means born on Wednesday in New York. It's not as common, but there are a lot of people from Ghana there, that sort of thing. Uh, in Memphis, it is not common at all. In New York, you live in a city that's really huge, so um, it's very easy to have a name like Kwaku and still feel a, a level of anonymity because there's so many people. And when you mm -hmm. live in a smaller town and you have a name that's really unique, um, people, you know, people will be like, oh, yeah, well, I, I met that guy. <laughs> you know, um, and so while it's easier to connect with people, you lose a level of anonymity, which is also kind of nice as well to not feel um, so singular in a scenario, but feel that you can just blend in. Yeah. And, you know, with your name, I was just going to ask that, by the way, what's with the name? Because my name, <laughs> I know all my life, everybody just does not get how to pronounce my name. Am Rami, I pronouncing it correctly? Rami, 
yes you did and i and okay. i so love you for that one because <laughs> <Thank> you know <laughs> <laughs> it's just this literally in front of them, but because the more common names they have, they pronounce it as that one. And my name's my name means obedient. So I'm like, my parents were like really smart. They <laughs> named me obedient. And at times, even you know, once I came crying to my dad, and I'm like, you know what, you'll change my name today. Go to that, you know, the, um, it was actually an office where you have birth certificates and stuff. I'm gonna go there and change my name, like right now. Right. But you know, right. I have my days. Um, and then I realized it's, it's, it's unique. It's beautiful. Yeah. And well, yeah, they're very rarely people would uh, <laughs> pronounce it right. But well, yes, I, I just love my name. You know, at, at the end, it's just a good, it's a good thing. Mm. Now, um, now tell me innovation. What, what to you is innovation? Like what is your definition, your own for innovation if you wouldn't share that Raheen that is a great question and I've, I've got to be honest I've never heard that that question before um how did I de 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 define innovation um I mean define innovation you can get it off of Google but what yeah, is you your can get it off of oh yeah. okay yeah how do I view innovation um I view innovation as the process of of making connections and discovering things, um, discovering things that uh, and making making connections and discovering things that have not actually really been talked about yet, and th and those things that you're making connections to and discovering will shape what society looks like five, ten, fifteen years down the road. Yes. That is, you know, that's kind of how I would define it. And to be honest, and, you know, I know you've been interviewing me, but I need to really compliment you because when I was 13, one, this technology didn't exist, but I don't know mm -hmm. if I would have done or even had the idea to do what you're doing. So that's why I was so intrigued when you contacted me because this is very innovative to be, to be <laughs> your age and to try to connect with people and use those connections to help you understand your world and the future that you might want that to me is innovative and that that that's brilliant the i wish more people your age were into using technology in this way to and they are but you're doing it in a really really unique and innovative way to sort of help define the place that you want to live in and define the person you want to be and that's i think that's fantastic Thank you so much. And that was something that I do in interviews when I have my diva moment, I would say, okay. you know, my moment <laughs> in the interview. Yeah. Uh, and you know what, this is actually uh, something that I, that I've been doing, just like you said, uh, I have, I contact children as well, uh, mm. my age, a bit older, a bit younger. And then, you know, sometimes they might talk to their parents than them, their interests, and how they can contact people with the same interest and just talk about it, you know, yeah. chat about it. Um, and it's and it's really fun and um, because one of my interests is, and something that I advocate for, is the love, care, and respect of children mm -hmm. for a more peaceful world. And I've been working on it, and that's what I do. In Pakistan, I look for more children that might have the same interests, talk to their parents, because, of course, we need parents' consent. And then we do sessions every month. Uh, last, uh, you know, yesterday, actually, uh, we had one in the last month. Uh, so we keep doing at least one session a month about the love, care and respect of children. And then we also keep adding some more perspectives to that uh, when it comes to a topic for a month. So it's very interesting. Um, hmm. No, it's brilliant. It's, it's really, really great. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> Now tell me more about your uh, journey with um, innovation, because how is it being an innovation di director? And one thing that I must ask you to my um, exposure of innovation, can innovation actually be directed or not? I mean, just asking. No, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Maybe, maybe I should change my title to uh, an innovation <laughs> curator um, because you're right. You don't really direct discovery. Um, but instead you, at least I try to put myself in a place where I can discover things. Um, and so a lot of that, even over the past, uh, let's say three years 
has been really trying to connect with things outside of education um, to better understand how to um, create educational experiences for kids. If we, you know, we've gotten to this point where we think of school as a separate thing from the world that we live in, when it really should be more of a response to the things in the world that we don't see, you know, so <laughs> what you were talking about with your, um, with this program, the idea of, of, of focusing on the care and the love of children, that feels like a response to something that we, that I don't see enough. And I'm assuming that might've been part of your inspiration for starting this program. And so, uh, you know, tying it back to your question, being an innovation director is, to me, it's sort of exposing yourself to as many things as possible um, to create a better or a larger lens through which I can kind of see the world and see things that I feel five, 10 years down the road, um, students are going to have to understand or be comfortable with or, or even have experience with so that they don't feel surprised or um, unprepared once they leave the, uh, the, the primary school setting, which is, you know, ages five to 18. Wonderful. Now, would you want to share something that um, about, about the program that you are an innovation director of, which is part of another big educational program that you told? Yep. Uh, would you want to share that? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, and it's, you know, we have younger students, so I'm not sure how much, like, what I can do naming-wise as far as this, the school is concerned, but I work for um, a program that's part of a, uh, what they call here a Jewish day school. Uh, so it's a school that focuses, uh, it's a pluralistic school that focuses on educating students and giving them the spiritual lens uh, or through the spiritual lens of Judaism. Um, I myself am not Jewish, but working at the school, I've learned a lot um, around, I learned a lot about how um, there are all these uh, really amazing parts of Judaism that focus on um, caring um, for not just um, yourself, but your community and the world at large. And so a lot of the, well, this is one thing I can talk about. We're working on this project now um, that involves um, having kids connect to what they're learning through activities like farming, and then also finding ways to blend that with technology as well. Um, and it ties to a, this larger concept, to Alam, uh, which means to heal the world. But the the way they're doing it, or the way, actually I shouldn't say the way, the way we're doing it collectively at the school is finding ways to heal the world locally around us using that lens and then tying that to things like um, uh, food, uh, food justice, uh, the concept of eliminating things that we have here in the, in the States, things like um, uh, food deserts, the idea of not being able to get fresh food um, or healthy food because of where you live and sort of finding ways to empower people to develop their own means of, of either growing or acquiring that food and then leveraging tools like technology and student imagination to get to that point. So from a student perspective, you are learning all of these different things. You're learning math, you're learning science, you're learning about English, you're learning lit, you're learning about literature but you're applying it to something that is really tangible and it's real, which gives you a sense of purpose and it gives you um, uh, a sense of, of being a valued with a value within your community because you're actually creating change. And so that to me is innovation, the idea of empowering students to feel that they have purpose within life and then giving them the tools to make the, the changes that they want to see within the world. Amazing. I mean, I feel like I, I, I totally feel you because although I've been going in, a, in an orthodox school, I would say, all my life, and I feel like this is really important. You know, given that spiritual lens, that is, and I feel like we've crafted humanity. Spiritual lenses are important. We need to, they need to be given to children or the youth. So. Amazing. Honestly, today's interview was something um, so special to me. 
and this I can that I can bet on that this is going to be staying with me forever um and not on just my profile but with like in my heart in my mind um thank you so much I really really appreciate you being here giving the time the information because I really want to say this thing that it does take courage to uh, tell your story or what you're doing at times because it's like telling a part of your soul to somebody you know right. so I, I really appreciate that you did that and trusted me with the information not just me but my audience as well so um behalf of the audience I'm thanking you. Uh, and what is uh, now two last questions? If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do so? The best way would be Twitter. Um, so, the, and that's easy. That's just at Kwaku, K W A K U 1. Hmm. Nice. I, yeah. So, that, and I will put that in the chat for you. Um, so, you can, you can post. Yeah, I can that. make it a banner and put it on the screen. And second thing, what is the one message that you like to give to all the people watching? Um, I'm going to circle back to something that you said, the idea of choosing a career. Um, I, you know, I mean, when we, you know, this is only 30 minutes. So I think I've had a minimum of three careers, um, but it's been more, you know, in different, if you're going to dig into it a little deeper. Um, the you, you do not have to define who you're going to be for the rest of your life at any point in your life, because you can always pivot. You can always pick up a new skill, learn something different and, and sort of evolve into the person that you see yourself or the direction that you see yourself going in. Um, a lot of people are trapped by circumstance, whether it's finances or location, that sort of thing. Um, and I, and that totally makes sense. And we are, we are just coming into this age now where we have so much access to information that those walls don't exist. And this conversation is evidence of this. I, you know, Raheen, you reached out to me a week ago um, yeah. and you are, and you're in Pakistan. Is that, is that where you are? Yeah. Right. And you and I are having a conversation about something um, that, you know, I, 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 I couldn't even fathom doing this at your age. And so I, I guess my point is that we are through things like technology, we have a lot of power to define who we're going to be and don't let uh, a bad grade or not getting a job or not getting into a college feel like that is defining you because we are the people who define ourselves. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching, for coming, giving us the time. And yeah, it was honestly just amazing. So yeah, thank you so much. And with this, I'm ending the broadcast, but um, I'll be coming back with another wonderful person. Well, I think nobody can measure up to you, but <laughs> You're I don't know, somewhere there. <laughs> thank you for having me.